soon. And what I'd like to do today is talk to you about modeling the musculoskeletal system, but drawing kind of a, a bigger picture on where we stand, why we would be interested in modeling the musculoskeletal system, and then talk to you a bit about the tools and the workflows that we use that are current in some of the research that's on ongoing here. And hopefully you'll be able to see maybe some parallels with some of the work you've already seen from the heart and lung group, as well as some of the commonalities and the tools that we put together and use. So as a bit of an overview, we're gonna talk a little bit about modeling the musculoskeletal system, some of the, the key problems, and these are the clinical drivers. That, that, you know, we're, we're all about clinical translation, as are the other groups uh, around the institute and within MedTech Core. It's about translating our work outside of the lab and into the clinic. And uh, there, there are a key number of uh, hurdles or challenges that we need to address before we can get into the clinic. So I want to talk about what those are specific to our problems, but these are, uh, you, as I'm sure you'll all be aware, that they are kind of generic problems that most of us will have to address, particularly if we if we're talking about translating uh, computational models into the clinic. And then I'm going to talk about some limitations of our existing workflow. And of course, we're not going to end on a, on a down note. We're going to talk about what some of the solutions and possibilities are to those, to those limitations. So let's start off with you know, why would we be interested in, in modeling the musculoskeletal system. And I think most people are critically aware that at the moment we have an aging and increasingly overweight population. And this is leading to really an epidemic of musculoskeletal disorders. And these disorders range from osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, two real big ticket items, things like stroke, which is the leading cause of disability in the world, as well as issues such as diabetes. And I've put one up here just uh, is kind of a sport, more sports medicine oriented one which is patellofemoral pain and even though you may not think of this as a major problem if you look at the costs and these come from the U United States you know there's over a billion dollars spent per annum in rehabilitation costs for, for this disorder so uh, uh, and um, all of these combined have some pretty alarming statistics so here you know this is a bit dated now but in, Aust in Europe alone every eight seconds there's an osteoporotic fracture so while I've been sitting here rambling on to you there's been already a dozen fractures in Europe so the and these figures are set to double by 2050 you know these are alarming statistics this is an interesting one so joint replacements in the United States in the next 15 years are going to increase almost sevenfold and we can't sustain this, we can't keep it up in terms of our current medical model. We, we just can't afford to have a sevenfold increase in joint replacements. It's just not, not possible. And so, you know, we, we, need, we need solutions to these problems and the solutions then have to be more on the preventative side as, as much as possible as, as opposed to trying to fix these after the fact. So, just a quick question out there, what do these disorders have in common? Anyone? want to throw something out there. What could you see that maybe is common across those disorders from a very high level? Bones, yep. Involved in the bones, yep, for sure. And what think about the kind of the etiology or the progression of the disease or how people might get these diseases and other things. What's really common there? Is it due to genetics? Is there a predisposition to get it from diet? Is there a predisposition for the loads that we experience? There's actually, of all of those disorders, loading is a key feature that is linked to the onset, the progression and the severity of these disorders. And so I did some work at Stanford for a number of years and I worked with these two gentlemen, Dennis Carter and, and Gary Beaupre, and for decades they've been doing some really interesting research to try and understand the relationship between the mechanical load history of a tissue and its phenotype. You know, how, how is it that articular cartilage becomes um, this particular phenotype, this tissue? How is it that ligament and tendon becomes this type of tissue? And they have this really nice statement from 
this is a textbook that they've written, Skeletal Function and Form. I consider it the Bible if you're interested in musculoskeletal um, form and function. And what's really key here is the statement that says the existence of such a hierarchy, and they're talking about the, the hierarchy that exists uh, in, the, in the physical order of organ, tissue, cell and molecular levels and I think that's common across what we are interested in as well uh, that modelling per se uh, can, can cross multiple scales both temporal as well as spatial so here it's you know more of a spatial scale but this is a result of a unique and complex phylogenetic and ontogenetic history in which genes and mechanical forces provide critical control and these two things that are, are critically linked, the genes and the mechanical loads. But what's really nice about their approach is that they can have relatively simple models of the tissue without need going to the cellular or the molecular levels, they can have fairly simple models of the tissue to characterize the, the localized strain and the strain history of the tissue. And what this is showing is depending on where you sit in this kind of area dictates what kind of tissue you have. So for example, a fibrous connective tissue like ligament or tendon is typically under tensile load. So it sits in this top quadrant here where there, there's tension and its principal strain history is also tensile forces. But if you get an area of tendon that wraps around a bone, you can get a point here that's actually under compression as the tendon wraps around bone you could imagine then there's compressive forces here and what happens is that that bit of tendon there becomes more like bone and so the mechanical forces then are, there's a tight coupling and regulation of the tissues based on the load history that the tissue experiences and there's lots of other good examples articular cartilage likes to see uniform pressure because it has very low friction at the surface and it's mostly water, 70% water. So those forces are taken up through uniform hydrostatic pressure and so it has, uh, it sits down here in this quadrant with mostly compression and its strain history is also compression. But if you damage the cartilage, if you damage the surface of the cartilage, you no longer have zero friction at the surface, you can have shear forces you have frictional forces that distort the tissue and suddenly you start creeping up into this area you start getting more strain in the tissue and that distortional stress, stress causes cartilage to turn to fibrocartilage so anyway it's kind of nice paradigm because if you're a tissue engineer so there's people in this room who are interested in tissue engineering if you understand this paradigm you could then take cells in a, in a culture and you could put them under the necessary mechanical loads and you can actually push them into different phenotypes if you give them there's also this kind of link there's also some biological goodies you can throw in there that that help the process but it's really interesting to, to understand that you know the, the tissue adapts and responds to its mechanical environment so if we understand that mechanical environment and the tissue's response to loads we have a chance of designing appropriate treatment strategies and that are, um, can also be used for prevention I mean prevention is ultimately uh, the goal here so this is our goal is to develop musculoskeletal models to predict clinical outcome and personalized treatment strategies that's our, our bigger aim here and what we're trying to do so before we can translate this information from our computational model and go into the clinic there are three main challenges we need to address and I think these are across the board what you'll see f whether you're modeling heart, lung, skin, tissue, what, you know, whatever it is that you're, you're doing here. The first of those is creating models that are specific to a patient and more and more we're hearing these buzzwords personalization um, you know patient specific models or subject specific models and what does that mean and, and how patient specific are we or how patient specific do we need to be in order to characterize uh, uh, an issue or a problem a disorder and then address it uh, there's some questions about about how we do that but ultimately th this is a problem we need to address the second main issue is validation. We need to have some way of always testing our models under the condition that they're, that they're designed for. Models are always designed with some idea in mind of well this is what I want my model to show me or predict. 
and the predictive capability then needs to be tested and this is what I mean by validation. If I say my model is to predict contact forces at the knee, which we'll talk about, then I need some way of actually hopefully experimentally measuring those forces and then asking my model if it can reproduce those forces. So, so that's a critical step. This step's really important to convince your clinical colleagues that what you're doing is going to be useful and, and can translate into the clinic. Because if the clinician has doubts about your model, I mean that you're going to have a hard time convincing him or her to actually use this in a clinical setting. And then the final thing you need to do is show that our models are predictive. Because if we can't predict new or, or, or novel things with our model or come up with treatment strategies that we could test in silico within the modeling environment, then you know what use is the model unless it's just to really understand a, a key biological um, question. Okay, so creating subject specific models, this is the workflow that we typically use. Notice we're getting down to tissue level stresses and strains. You could push beyond that and you can go to cellular level. Some of our colleagues do some cellular work or you know, even further to molecular. But essentially the process and the workflow is very similar to what you've seen before. You're going to start off with some sort of geometry. You want to capture the, the geometry and the geometry is very important. You want to characterize some material properties of that tissue that you're interested in. You need to describe some loads and boundary conditions. And in the musculoskeletal system, we're talking then about the kinematics, uh, typically of, of this multi-body segment system, which is our skeleton. And you need to describe the muscle and joint forces. The muscle forces are really what drive the internal contact forces within the joint. And so these, these are critical to, to understand and they're also very hard to get because you can't measure them directly. And ultimately then end up in some sort of tissue stress. So this is an example of some work I've done on the patellofemoral joint. Your patella is your kneecap. So these are stresses within the cartilage of the kneecap. So we, you know, that might be a research question. We want to, for an individual, characterize what kind of stress distribution there is in, in the patella. So unfortunately, this process is very time consuming and costly. Okay, these things are obviously intimately linked. Now, if, it, if it's gonna go into a clinic and you say, well, that's great, we can take these measurements potentially in the clinic, but it's gonna take us three weeks to build our model and get back to you, uh, it's not gonna fly, right? In the clinical world, they're just gonna say, forget it. So we need to address that problem. This, uh, I'll just talk about an <coughs> a project I've been involved in it's called the Grandy Challenge, and it's with colleagues Daryl DeLima, who's at the Scripps Clinic in San Diego, and he has uh, designed a, a knee joint replacement to have load cells within it. So, and then these knee joint replacements have gone into actual patients, four of them, and it's also down the stem of the tibia. There's also uh, uh, an RF coil that you can charge using inductive power and you can transmit those forces out and, and capture them. So these people can walk around and we can measure the actual forces within their knee joint. And BJ Frigley, uh, who's at the University of Florida, he, Daryl and I had an NIH grant a couple of years ago, uh, it's, it's just it finished last year, to collect a data set on these patients and post this data to an online community, to, to the biomechanics community, and we said, uh, you can have all of the information we've captured from motion capture to geometry, uh, we've reaction forces at the ground, we had people walking on force plates, and we gave them everything we could except the actual forces that were inside the knee. And we said to the modeling community, how well do your models work to predict the internal forces of the knee? So these internal forces are on the medial side of the knee, so the inside of the knee, the lateral side, and the combination of the two. So this is the total joint contact force. So these are some predictions that we're doing with our models where we have some generic model, which is in dashed, the instrumented knee data is the gray, and then one which has subject specific geometry, and you can see the one with subject specific geometry does a little bit better. But the other thing that we've found from this exercise is that, you know, we, we're, kind of crappy at <laughs> predicting what the internal forces are. You know, these are not exact predictions by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and the ones that we're showing here are actually pretty good. This is from work that a colleague, uh, she was a postdoc, Pauline Juris, uh, with a colleague of mine in, 
in Griffith University and Pauline was doing these simulations and these were pretty much at the time the best that anyone had ever done on predicting the contact forces and already you can see well a mm, little bit off here but nonetheless uh, this is required because we want to test our ability of our models to predict the internal forces okay and if we can't do that then the use of our models is, is questionable so there's been quite a lot of effort since then you know this was published already uh, four years ago and we're, we're building on top of that and it's only because we've made all these data uh, we had a competition by the way so you'd win you could win the prize at the end of it and and it's led to thousands of downloads of a, of a unique data set and we had this competition for five years in a row every year we'd have a new patient and a new data set so that's been a really for the community that's been a really good uh, a good thing for us to be able to test our models okay so the final challenge is to then prove some sort of clinical utility of the model this is a workflow again that you'll kind of be familiar with and I'll get to that <coughs> in the next slide but this is work that we're doing with Sue Stott the Department of Surgery and it's dealing with patients who have what's called slip capital femoral epiphysis and you'll have to remember that by the end of today uh, I'm going to ask you on, on what that term is but it's a condition that affects uh, young individuals whose growth plates have not fully developed, fully matured. And what happens is the growth plate here, this is the femur, this is the top of the thigh, as it articulates into the hip joint, the ball and socket joint. And what happens is in these patients, these, these young children who are typically overweight, obese children, experience really large loads and it causes this thing to slip. The surgeon says it's like an ice cream falling off an ice cream cone. Just slips to one side but as you can imagine this is a terrible thing for a 10 year old to have because there is there is nothing you can do to bring the joint back to its normal health what the surgeon will typically do is grab this dirty great big screw and go right through the the bone and prevent it from slipping any further but in terms of whether or not that surgeon has done the right thing who knows they're, they're just using the intuition to say well we think we've done the right thing but you only get one shot at this this is a child <laughs> 10 years old and you're doing orthopedic surgery on them so what we said is look why don't we take some medical imaging data and some gait data get these patients to walk around inside a lab where we can measure the way they they move we can customize a model and we can then have a model that predicts the movement and estimate what the forces are in this joint and if we can reconstruct the anatomy of the joint and provide forces we can do a virtual surgery we can actually in silico put the joint into different positions and orientations and see what the stress distributions are see if there's a risk of further slipping should the, rather than just pin this joint should the should the surgeon maybe cut a wedge and do an osteotomy and rotate the joint to try and realign it and these are questions the clinical community has no way of solving right now and this is really where a model becomes critically useful and this this process of course because it's all in silico can be done iteratively uh, you can do design optimization and you can try and find the best outcome on a virtual patient before you actually go in and do the real deal so that's just a kind of a snapshot and an example so this is a slide you've seen before and you know this this is all the same stuff right we're basically doing some observation, um, doing some sort of processing on the data that we've got. It might be segmenting out the data, it might be processing motion capture, movement, kinematic data. You build up an, a model and that model includes the anatomy, the structure, as well as the, the critical components like the material properties. Um, whatever is important to characterize in that model. You perform some experiments and these could be in silico then simulations. Um, you might then visualize the data. You might do some data reduction and I'll talk about that as well a little bit later and do some prediction and go around again. So it's exactly the same process you know, and, and you've already seen that so you're kind of familiar with what's going on here. So there are some limitations to the current workflow that we have. And I thought it'd be nice to talk about them because this is setting the scene in for our group and what we're doing to address these limitations and, and move forward. So here's our workflow, right, in terms of getting 
from some experimental data to creating models to estimating loads and boundary conditions down to creating a model of the tissue and of course we're now in the finite element domain we're using continuum mechanics to solve tissue related stress strain okay so here are the limitations first of all we typically get information from our subjects from motion capture so we've got little markers that we do optical tracking with in a gate lab you're constrained to be within a lab so we might get children with cerebral palsy and this has happened uh, this is you know real real life scenario we ask the child with with cerebral palsy it's a neurological condition and these kids have trouble walking normally we ask them to walk as normal as they can in the lab and they walk across some force plates we measure the forces we capture their 3d movement and we take that snapshot from say three or five trials and we say this is how this child walks and we say to the child thanks very much that's great we've captured our data then they're free to go the child kind of hops and runs outside and goes and plays basketball I mean there's this is a child with CP and we're, we're characterizing them from a lab trial that's very synthetic it's not the real world okay and we're extrapolating this information to say yeah this is in general the loads and boundary conditions on this on the subject what they do in the real world they run upstairs they go hop curbs they do all kinds of different things that have nothing to do with what we've measured in the lab so this is a problem and we need to address this problem the second problem or issue that we've um, th this is more of a problem with the, the rest of the world because they do it wrong but we do it um, much better here is uh, the the rest of the world currently have these have these models these are rigid body dynamic models they make assumptions that the bones are treated as rigid bodies so they don't deform that simplifies computational modeling a lot if we've just got rigid bodies and the question here is well these line segments that represent muscles are going to give us our, our forces and boundary conditions and the way that we get to our new geometry here you know 90 99 percent of the population of biomechanics researchers who do these type of simulations will do some l simple linear scaling to fit the geometry okay so there's a software that's very popular it's called open sim it's developed by colleagues of mine at stanford and it's about 10 years on now and there's about a community of three and a half thousand users worldwide so there's it, it's been well adopted by the community that may not sound like a lot but in terms of you know other like-minded geeks around the world there's quite a few of them and they're doing the simple scaling the problem is that simple scaling does not account for any of the normal variations you get in bone shape and structure okay if you linearly scale your pelvis in all three dimensions you're not capturing the fact that well you've got a female pelvis that's quite different looking than a male pelvis okay the, none of that's captured in there so the other thing that's interesting is uh, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of doing this too don't get me wrong I mean it's only up until recently that we've, we're getting tools to kind of address this and do a better job but um, the line segment muscles are kind of treated to to show the the line of action of force of the muscle and we all know our muscles are volumetric uh, it's much more complicated than that but you know for now that's kind of been the de facto standard and, and it, it's an issue we need to address um, when we solve for our muscle forces often again this has only changed in, in the last five years or so often we don't solve for things like joint contact and I'll give you an example around the knee joint to simplify the modeling of the knee joint in this kind of domain in rigid body domain you might treat this as a mechanical hinge joint you might say it has one degree of freedom it can only flex and extend the real joint has all six degrees of freedom it can translate it can rotate in all three directions but you know for simplification we're just going to treat it as a hinge joint if we model it as a hinge joint and we say well these muscle forces have to produce this movement we can derive equations of motion okay and we can be consistent with Newton so that he doesn't turn in his grave so F equals ma we can calculate these forces calculate the segmental accelerations we can integrate forward in time and and do a, a dynamic simulation that predicts the movement forward in time and we can say well we predict this 
these forces give rise to this movement. Now, you could imagine, if you've got a pin joint here, you can imagine a variety of muscle forces that give you the same net flexion extension movement, but if you suddenly had a different degree of freedom in there, if, if the knee could suddenly abduct and adduct, the same set of muscle forces that you could derive for flexion extension suddenly now cause the, the knee to spin sideways. Right? So if you provide these degrees of freedom, you very much constrain the possible set of muscle forces that you can get. But right now we don't do this. We don't couple between uh, a contact simulation and a rigid body dynamic simulation. We, we typically have these decoupled. We solve this in one domain over here, we take these forces and results and we put them into another domain over here. So you might have joint contact and continual mechanics here and rigid body dynamics there. But this is a problem. If we can join the two together, we're more likely to get better estimates of muscle forces. So that, that's something that we need to address. Segmentation is always an issue. Okay, this is time consuming and it's retarded. We don't need to all be segmenting the same bones over and over again. And you'd be surprised. I mean, that this is usually the first six months of a PhD's life here at the ABI. Okay, here's some medical imaging data. Go ahead and segment. Okay, there's smarter ways of getting around that, and I'll talk about those in a minute. And here's the issue I just mentioned before. There's a disconnect between the two domains, the rigid body dynamics and the finite element model. The finite element model is typically from segmented imaging data, whereas our rigid body dynamic model uh, comes from our simple scaling back up here. Here's our rigid body dynamic. So we've done some linear scaling and this does not match your medical imaging data. So we're already, our ge geometry is not even consistent, right, between the two domains. So that's a problem. Um, if I'd known about all these problems, I would never have accepted half of my publications that I've got so far. <laughs> But um, anyway, thankfully somebody else uh, reviewed them and not myself. Uh, imaging of joints is mostly done in a static position. Okay, you're lying down on a scanner. That might be an MR scanner, it might be CT. Ultrasound's kind of nice because you can get some dynamics. Uh, but ultimately, a lot of these done, uh, these imaging modalities are done in non-functional postures. Okay. They're static, they're non-weight-bearing. They're non so this is an issue because if we want to characterize the deformations of tissues and other things in a dynamic sense or the dynamic movement of a joint, uh, this will not do. We've done some work in real-time MR. Uh, before I came back to New Zealand five years ago, we were doing real-time MR in an open magnet. So this, the MR actually kind of looked like two halves of a donut. You could stand inside and do weight-bearing squats, which was pretty cool. Uh, and this is one of those images. This is my knee joint, actually, in a, in a weight-bearing loaded posture. You can see these are my ligaments, my cruciate ligaments, which thankfully I have them still intact. Uh, here's your patella, your kneecap, and this is cartilage just here. Um, so we were looking at using real time. The problem is this is really slow. This is about three to four frames per second. So you can only go very slowly, and it's only giving you a single slice. So, uh, the resolution wasn't great. You know. The, Th there's limitations there that w we need to address. And finally then, when we get to our FE domain, this is just a model that I was using to look at patellofemoral contact, and there's a whole bunch of issues with this, with this model, and you could, you know, again, tear it apart and, and critique it, but for its purpose at the time, it was suitable for answering the research questions that I had. That's the key thing when you develop your model, is be clear about your research questions and make sure your model is adapted to answering those research questions and within those research questions. Because there's always more you can add to a model. There's always limitations of a model. Just know what they are and be clear about it, especially when you're presenting presenting your work. Anyway, our models here, were, they were quasi-static, they weren't dynamic. Uh, they involved, again, line segment of muscles. The bones were rigid, so we weren't looking at deformations, stress strain in the, in, the, in the bone tissue. And we had some simplifications of our material properties of cartilage. We know cartilage under dynamic activity, dynamic load, it behaves pretty close to a linear elastic solid. So you can make this gross assumption if you're interested just in kind of gait or dynamic type behaviours. 
if you're interested in how fluid flows through the tissue, this is obviously not going to work for you. You need to do something a little bit more sophisticated. But anyway, those are some limitations of our current approach. Now, of course, I'm not going to leave you with limitations. I'm going to leave you with solutions and possibilities. And here is then some of the work that we're doing to address these challenges. And it's the same workflow. This time we've got some different tools. So one of the things we're really quite keen on is to measure people outside the lab. And one approach is wearables. Wearable sensors are now everywhere. They're ubiquitous. Uh, inertial sensors, this is just one um, from a startup company that I just happen to be involved in and I declare conflict of interest there. But you know, th these are ubiquitous. They're in, the, they're in everybody's cell phones nowadays, inertial sensors. But can we then create a model that predicts the movement that's, um, that is then um, matched to the experimental data you get from these inertial sensors? So you're matching linear accelerations from the accelerometer and angular velocities from a gyroscope. And yes, you know, we should be able to do this. We should be able to construct a model that has the certain degrees of freedom we want with enough sensors that we can reconstruct motion. And we're not the first people to do this. There's other groups in the world that are leading the charge on this, but it would enable us to get outside the lab, to put sensors on our patients and characterize their movements in real world settings. And I think that's very important. And it also opens the door because you can start connecting these guys with these guys for real time feedback. And I'll talk about some of the real time feedback we're doing. Statistical shape modeling has, has and will be an important aspect of our workflow in years to come. And so this idea is that you, if you have enough data and you can perform st some statistical analysis on, the, on this data, you can characterize the variability of that data. Now whether that data is time series data or in this case it might be nodes on a mesh, the variability in shape. Right, the XYZ coordinates of these nodes, you can perform some data reduction methods and very efficiently characterize the variation in geometry. And this is really nice because then you can do some interesting population type modeling. If, if your data set, for example, we use a data set from Melbourne from the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine and they do post-mortem CT, whole body CT. So we get access to those data, we segment them out and we make models that can characterize the femur, for example, this was Zhu Zhang's uh, PhD thesis. He did that with Paul Nielsen um, here at the Institute. And the, the idea is that you could accurately characterize all of the different shape variations of the femur with very few uh, modes of variation. So this was from a principal component analysis, looking at the different modes of shape. So using this idea, what we've done is with help of some of the software team who are sitting in the room right now, uh, generated or created um, a workflow manager. And you guys know already, you've heard about this, right? The map client. And it's the, it, it came from this concept. I actually stole the acronym MAP. I stole it from Alistair Young, who previously had CAP, which was the Cardiac Atlas Project. But MAP is a much better acronym because it has so many other meanings and connotations, right? So it's much cleverer, I thought. Anyway, so I stole the acronym, called it the Musculoskeletal Atlas Project, and I got some funding from the FDA to do this. Now, why on earth would the FDA give us money to develop this? Well, they're interested in, in silico virtual trials of medical devices. So if you have a new orthopedic implant, and that implant is for a hip joint and it needs to go down the stem of a femur, well wouldn't it be nice if you had this population model of the femur that characterizes all of the geometry of not only the outer cortex, you know, the outside geometry of the femur, but also the inner cortex. Because then you could accurately characterize how well this new device fits in this population of 300 individuals. That would be very useful. So anyway, we got some funding from them and we put together this, I, th this concept where we would have some sort of client application and the client could receive information of medical imaging data, motion capture, EMG, any functional data you might have. You can use the client then to bring this data in. You can create workflows within here to do some modeling. You could also link 
the data to a repository and the repository would have this superset of information that's being collected from people all around the world data models and other things that could eventually be linked to FDA for regulatory approval it could also be linked to journals um, you know to test out your ideas and, and for review purposes so it's kind of has lots of functions and ultimately you know you could you could spit out a model from this client as well and that model might be useful for open CMOS, it might be used for open sim which is our rigid body dynamics mm -hmm. and there's a couple of other packages that we're kind of linking to as well and so this this was the concept um, just briefly because you guys will probably know more about the map client than I will by the end of this um, but this was our criteria we wanted to have uh, a client side application designed in an easy to use uh, um, and, and common language and Python of course was the, the language of choice here because it's free open source and it's the language of choice for, for a lot of science and it's growing in popularity we wanted to have modular designs it, it's workflow driven because again regardless of whether it's the heart or the lungs or whatever musculoskeletal system you're kind of doing the same thing right you're doing the same workflows and the idea too is we have this plug-in architecture so Im embedded in this idea was that you could read some DICOM files so standard imaging uh, you could do some visualization you could do some standard uh, segmentation and registration these are just basic set of plugins essentially that would create workflows and, and we call the plugin steps of course uh, the the segmentation to mesh fitting you know this was really come from the ABI the idea that you would have these higher order elements that capture cubic variability between nodes instead of just linear variability so you need far fewer elements to capture the the, the geometry of of the tissue and so we threw those tools in there as well um, we said well we want to do, be able to do some host mesh fitting I don't know if you guys dealt with or talked about that at all I don't know if you will you get to that in this the idea that you start off with a template mesh and you can embed that template in a host and that might be just a cube and you deform the cube such that your your mesh that fits within that now suddenly fits your new data set and you can apply these kind of methods as well for doing uh, for, for doing non-linear scaling and really at the heart of all of this too was uh, this idea that you could drive your segmentation fitting model generation with underlying shape models and so again this was the work of Ju Zhang from his PhD and he stayed on as a postdoc for the last couple of years now unfortunately he's leaving us in September but he's not going far because he's starting his own company that's going to be using shape models to design orthopedic implants and we're working with OSIS who are in Christchurch and um, helping them with a workflow um, that automatically generates implants for uh, revision hip joint surgery but anyway Ju's kind of been the main driver of putting all of these plugins together and ultimately we'd also want the map client to run your simulations so you make your model you can spit it out to open CMOS and call it back um, you know that that's kind of the ultimate goal anyway so that's that's the overview of, of how to address that problem um, Pablo's quite familiar with this stuff but for the rest of you there's an idea here that the the way that muscles are activated and muscle forces are critical as I said before in determining what the loads are on the on the musculoskeletal system and muscles are activated of course by virtue of the central nervous system okay everyone has brain or most of us have a brain and it's connected to a spinal cord and there's a cerebellum that's connected there that's driving lots of different activation patterns of our muscles that cause us to move and these are modulated at different levels it can be modulated uh, at, at very high levels or it could be modulated at spinal cord level you know low level modulation as well but what the neuroscience literature have been doing quietly over the next uh, last decade is developing models of this to show that you can in the same way that you can characterize the variability in shape of a bone you can characterize the variability and the synergies the way that muscles are activated together and do some mathematical data reduction and it turns out that you can you can get say five principal modes that can modulate the activation patterns that correspond to 95 percent of the EMG that you see in your lower limb muscles 
during walking. So this is pretty interesting because now we can say, well, okay, perhaps we can get a better representation of all of these muscle activations by only measuring a subset, a few number of, of key muscles and using this idea of synergies. So this is a way of reducing the redundancy of, of muscle activations. The other thing that we're working on is surrogate models of contact. So that's crossing the domain between the kinematics and, and uh, joint contact. So this is a project that was funded from Marsden. It's now reaching an end and in the next uh, four months or so we've got left. And I've had a couple of PhD students working on this. I've been collaborating with David who's at Griffith. He was my PhD advisor um, years ago. Uh, back in the late 90s um, and working again with my colleague from the University of Florida. The idea here is that we've got wearable sensors, inertial sensors, strategically placed on the limbs. These can also measure muscle activity by EMG, electromyography. So we can get these kind of measurements of the joint angles, the joint movements, as well as the muscle activity and we develop a surrogate model of joint contact. So we've got a finite element model that finite element model has all the muscles that we care about and what you can do is you can probe this model offline you do, all, you do this, you build this model offline you basically say here's a combination of synergies that I would get during walking all these possible combinations now give me as an output what the stress distribution is of this tissue and what you do then is you build up this internal model and we use partial least squares regression for this you could use a new, an artificial neural network or something similar and you're basically saying here's a response surface for these inputs this is my output and once you've done that this, this becomes very quick to compute you can compute this in real time and uh, Tim Wu and who works now with Mark Sagar did his PhD with Kumar Mithratni and they did a really nice uh, presentation of a, a, a nice paper that showed this method using partial least squares regression to characterize the deformations of the face for animation. So they can use some very quick then uh, little sliders essentially to characterize all of the different movements of the face and get very accurate deformations of, of the soft tissue and the skin of the face. So we're just using exactly the same method but we're now predicting what the contact forces are. And this will work in real time so we can plug that into our, our um, our rigid body dynamic framework. We do some thing called data driven gait prediction. I don't have time to go into that today, but this, this is a way that we can, for an individual, prescribe a new gait pattern, a new way of walking. So the whole concept here is that you have someone with knee osteoarthritis, which mostly occurs on the inside of the joint. What you're going to do is you're going to tell this person how to walk to alter the joint loads and you can measure those joint loads in real time and you give feedback to the person the initial idea we were starting playing around with artificial muscle so Ian Anderson on level 5 um, we, we started playing around and Daniel Chen was a PhD student with us doing this where you could put the artificial muscle in your skin and then it would stretch your skin and via the skin stretch you can get this intuitive feedback about where you should be and, and how you should move um, we've, sent, we've done quite a lot of experiments on that uh, and we've since kind of moved away from the artificial muscle mostly because it's quite dangerous because you need very high voltages <laughs> to operate these things, actuate them. Uh, we're using vibrating motors and putting them in a, in a spatial arrangement so that you can get an, uh, and you activate them in a sequence and you can get this intuitive sense of rotation and movement. And we, we then close the loop and we can do this in real time and we can reduce someone's knee joint loads by about 30 to 40 percent in about two minutes and that's equivalent to uh, what a surgeon would do which is cut away a, a big wedge of bone and realign the joint so we we're pretty stoked that's a that's a great outcome for us the next thing would be well you know how do we get this to the clinic okay uh, just briefly then the imaging I talked about the limitations of imaging. This is 4D CT. This is about six to eight frames per second now, but this is full. With every frame, you get a full 3D reconstruction. This is the wrist. So this is flexion extension of the wrist. This is the radius um, and and the carpal bones. And so this is with a colleague who's at, um, now with Toshiba. And the idea is that you could have a dynamic acquisition and you could accurately characterize the dynamics uh, of the bones and then couple that in say with a finite element model and, and, and look at the um, stress distributions. 
we're moving away from these line segments and again building surrogates that represent the volumetric muscle and this was work from Justin Fernandez in his PhD which he did here at the Institute then he went to Melbourne did a postdoc and now he's back and Justin and Kumar have done quite a lot of work in this domain these are some simulations of a gastric nemius and this gastric nemius that we've assumed that all the fibers run parallel and you can probably guess what that's going to look like when you activate the muscles you get a pretty uniform contraction is this what a real muscle does? any guess? if you kind of looked at your calf muscle and did that no it's not the reason why is if you look at the real architecture now this is from diffusion tensure imaging again same tools as what the heart muscle uh, the heart group does but if you look at the fiber orientations these are highly complex fiber orientations the architecture is not very simple but if you embed that fiber architecture into the muscle and then you stimulate those then you get quite a different deformation you get something that's actually far more realistic actually and it changes the mechanical behavior of the muscle the idea here then is that we can again build a surrogate this time instead of doing a joint contact simulation we have 3D volumetric um, FE models of muscle and you create a lookup table then that goes back into your rigid body dynamics so then you can characterize the complicated fiber architecture and wrapping and this is work actually that's been extended by Jeff Hansfield who's a postdoc in our lab and Jeff's doing some uh, computational fluid dynamics and what he's doing is says well we're not going to get diffusion tensor imaging on every subject that walks into the lab but what if we could get a proxy for those fiber architecture by doing a fluid dynamic simulation and what he does he sets boundary conditions where the aponeurosis is, where the tendon attaches at the proximal and distal ends and he solves a fluid problem and says well if fluid was coming in here and exiting there how would it flow and it turns out it flows pretty much in line with the fiber architecture and so these are errors, these errors are bet between the um, computational fluid simulation and those fiber directions measured from diffusion tensor imaging and you can see the majority of these vectors are within 10 degrees so this is now a method that you could use to predict what the fiber architecture is without having DTI so again it's all about clinical translation and this is some work I've just only got a couple of slides left uh, Vicky Shim uh, treating then the tendon, this is the Achilles tendon, as a volumetric representation as opposed to a line segment. And what you can see with different patients, you get different stress distributions and you can characterize different loads and boundary conditions. You could predict the regions of rupture under these different load conditions, and a lot of this is dictated by the geometry. Uh, as well as the material properties so we, we're kind of working in the space of getting away from the line segment representations so that's it I'm going to end there and thank of course people involved there's probably there's a few more people that I've missed out on here Kumar was one who's done some work uh, with Justin on the um, deformations of uh, muscle architecture uh, there's been a number of people who have funded funded this work over the years um, but you know critically it's been done by the students that are that have been involved okay that's it so I'm happy to take questions I don't if we have 10 minutes for questions yep stunned silence <laughs> too much <laughs> too much it, are, are these kind of methods quite similar to what you've seen from other people in terms of workflows and is there anything new, any new ideas here that have kind of sparked your interest about, oh, maybe that's something I could use in my own research? No? Excellent. <laughs> okay. Andre and Hugh, do you have any points or things you'd like to add? Maybe things I'd... I don't know, I covered a lot, so maybe there's a lot there, but... I did have a question from earlier on, but you just sort of pushed out that all the other information came on the other side. It's good, that was the purpose. <laughs> Smoke and mirror, smoking Smokes exactly. I think it is good, I mean, you show pretty much the same sorts of stuff that we've seen with the and the it's all the same sort of... Thing. Yeah, yeah. It's very different applications, but... Very similar. Yep. Yeah. And I, a lot about 
pretty much what they're going to go through next in terms of what they're going to play, play around with themselves. Yep. So it should, should lead on very nicely to the part of this day. Yeah, great. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been a shame in some ways that we haven't worked more closely in the past. If you think about even us at the Institute, you know, we span five office floors here, and you think, well, surely you, you're you sharing all the code, right? You're all doing these surrogate models, or you're all doing some segmentation. You're all doing parts of the puzzle. And, and it's remarkable how little we actually share, I think given that we're doing the same stuff, just with a different application. And that was really one of the driving factors. When, when I first started, or, or when I wrote the grant to get funded for this musculoskeletal atlas project, uh, I, I did an invitation to the institute to see if anyone else was interested, and pretty much the whole institute turned up, because everyone's got a vested interest in this. And so then I realized, okay, this is much bigger than just the musculoskeletal group, even though it's, it's maintained the name, map client, which is kind of nice. We've stamped our authority on it and said it's musculoskeletal at this project. You know, it's the, yeah. the the end of the end result is really a generic workflow manager, and and you'll you'll experience it. And yeah, I'm slowly being taken over by everybody else, but we'll we'll see <laughs> see where that ends up. What? <laughs> yeah. I also can have a question from an outsider's perspective. So all these um, elements in the workflow that you presented just now, they are done only with map client or there are also other software that Yeah, okay, that's that's a good question. So Ultimately, we would like to have a lot of these steps integrated into Map Client. Mm -hmm. That it's a one-stop shop, it's all free, it's all open source, mm -hmm. and the idea is that people from around the world will contribute and, and everyone works together. Right. Not just our institute, you know, it's, it's broader than that. And, and science is all about adding on top of what people have done before. It doesn't make sense that we're all doing the same thing in different silos. So it's very much an open source philosophy that, that we have on it. The reality is that there's still a few parts of the puzzle that are done elsewhere. Excellent. So some of the, the simulation in particular, of course, uh, the dynamic simulation we do, uh, we use OpenSim for doing certain parts of the rigid body dynamics, but then we write our own code. For example, we have our own C code that does the EMG to muscle force. And that's work that I did for my PhD and we've continued to develop over years. So that that's a separate component. But the idea is that we get access to those components via the map client. So even if you don't know that code, if you have the hooks in place that you can have a wrapper or some, some calling function that says, okay, here's my model, now spit it out to this bit of code or this software over here and, and run a simulation and come back, then that's great. There's a f there's one thing I will say about that approach, and it's a it's a caveat or it's a bit of a danger, is that when you provide tools that are so easy to use, they can sometimes be misused. And I think this is what I mean by that is you know the finite element method is is kind of a good case in point. Uh, the finite element software that you can get nowadays is pretty easy to use. The commercial packages uh, you can you can put together some geometry, you can find some loads and boundary conditions and you can run a simulation. And you can, anyone can pretty much be taught how to do that. The biggest question though is, well what is that simulation telling us? What are the inputs to that simulation? I need to have a pretty good understanding of that model and, and what's in the guts of it before I can be confident of what it gives me in the end. And so there's a bit of a, a clash there because Ultimately, you'd like to know everything of that model, but you don't have the time to derive the finite element method from first principles and write your own FE code. That just doesn't make any sense to do that. And the same is true for rigid body dynamics and other, other codes and other solvers. But you just want to be critically aware of the models that you make and the limitations and the methods that you've used so that you know the results are all taken under that context. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. You know, because nowadays, yeah, it's it's easy to uh, plug and play and grab a model and run it and you know get results, yeah. but you want to be very critical of those results and where they come from and, and understand what's under the hood. So that that's the only caveat with 
making the software tools easy to use is that you still want to have a good understanding of what's under the hood. Cool. Okay. Thanks, everyone.